Like, how do you feel about the criticism that you got some people saying you're racist after the <laughs> Netflix? Yeah. Well, that that criticism was was because um, that's why we brought you on. We're like, we hope you're racist. We like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you kind of let me down with this whole everyone's equal talk. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, that that was interesting. Uh, the the subject of race is never mentioned in my Netflix series, Ancient Apocalypse. Mm-hmm. It's never mentioned at all. But when the Society for American Archaeologists wrote an open letter to Netflix demanding that my documentary series be class- reclassified as science fiction, they accused me of spreading racism, white supremacy, misogyny, and anti-Semitism. None of these issues are ever mentioned in the series. Wait, or, what was misogynistic? Yeah, this yeah, is yeah. Fun. I, I don't know. And 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 uh, you know, and what for that matter was anti-Semitic. It's a very and, and and what was racist? But since race is since race is never mentioned, but what these hmm. labels are very useful for, if you shout them loudly enough, oh, and yeah. if your friends in the media see a nice story here and pick them up and multiply it, what they're very useful for is turning people off the work of an opponent. Yes, and that was that was clearly what went on here. If you're radioactive. I don't even have to debate you because yeah. you're radioactive. That's right. Yes. That's right. Yeah. That's fund- fundamentally what went on. Yeah. Now, what, did, what is the reason for, what, what was the possible, they had no justification for any of the others, but what was the reason for saying that I was spreading racism and white supremacy? It's because in a number of my earlier books, I reported indigenous myths and traditions, particularly from South America and from Mexico, which re- in some cases referred to a white-skinned, bearded stranger and his companions who came after a time of darkness, after a great cataclysm, uh, bringing knowledge and teaching knowledge uh, to the inhabitants of the country. Now that is not me saying that, that is indigenous traditions. The view of archeologists today is that many of those traditions were simply made up by the Spanish conquistadors. Uh, I don't think that's true. There are many, there are many other uh, archaeologists who don't agree with that and think that they are true and genuine indigenous traditions and should, be, and should be rightly reported as such. Whether we're referring to Quetzalcoatl in Mexico or to Viracocha um, in uh, the Andes, uh, these, these traditions, it's a pan-American myth and, it, and, and they're, found, they're not only found in, in the Americas but all over the world. They don't always refer to a person as white skin. You know, the emphasis that, that's put on skin color today is, a, is really recent in human history. It's a few hundred years old. Uh, what, did, did the issue of white skin or black skin carry the same resonance 12,000 years ago that it carries today? I somehow doubt it. I doubt it very much. I don't see why, I don't see why it should because, because the, uh, the, the abuses of human rights that were, taken, that, that, were, that were carried out in the name of color uh, are recent developments. They're not ancient developments, you know, and, and, and therefore... Recent in the scale of human history. Recent in the scale of human history. Let's say, let's say the last five or six hundred years, some, something like that. They weren't, they weren't really there. They weren't really there before that. But it's a, it's a, it's a huge distraction from, from the major issue. Um, they also refer to these individuals as being bearded. Um, they often refer to there being seven of them. In ancient Mesopotamia, they're called the seven sages. Uh, in ancient Egypt at the Temple of Horus at Edfu, uh, they are also referred to as the seven sages. Uh, in ancient India, it's Manu and the seven, and the seven sages who appear after the flood, uh, trying to restore the knowledge that was lost during the time of the flood. These are indigenous traditions. Same story, different parts of the world. Same story, different parts of the world. That's one of the things that interests me about it. What interests me about it least of all is the issue of skin color. What interests me about it most of all is the issue that there, there seems to be a memory of a cataclysm after which a group of people tried to preserve knowledge from Is before the cataclysm. Is this the Snow White myth? <laughs> I'm not sure. She falls asleep. The seven dwarfs, or the yeah. seven sages, yeah. they come wake her up with the wisdom yeah. of a guy should make out with you when you're passed out. I need to reread the Snow White myth. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> there might be something there. This is yeah, good. Yeah, well, 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 no, because, because myths... You, you, myths are the memory bank of our species. This is what I loved about the Netflix special, treating the myths as a way of passing on true information. Yes. Yeah. And uh, yeah, and, and taking them seriously, not looking at them as figments of imagination. Yeah. If we were to pass on data and fact, it's way more digestible in the form of story. We memorize stories. If you wish to pass message, if you wish to pass information to a distant future, if you wish it to be preserved, you wouldn't be smart to just write it down. Mm. 
uh, how can we know that our script is going to be readable by any other culture? Let's say 10,000 years in the future. Will anybody be able to read the English language? Who knows? I, 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 have, I have no idea. It's, fra it's fragile. Uh, an example I often give is the Indus Valley civilization in uh, Pakistan and India. Um, the, the Indus Valley civilization, nobody actually knew that it existed until it was accidentally discovered while a railway was built, being built through a site now called Mohenjo-Daro. Um, in Pakistan, and then they found that there were these actually very, very sophisticated, very complex mud, mud brick structures on a very large scale. Then they began to look at it. Then they found that this culture had had a language, a fully developed written script. It's about 5,000 years old, but there isn't a single Rosetta Stone that enables us to translate that script into any more recent language. So we can't read that script. The script exists, but we can't read it. So there could be all kinds of information in that script, which would tell us all kinds of things about our past, but it's not, but it's not readable. And today. how long ago were they thriving? Uh, 5,000 years ago. Wow. One of the interesting things in the Indus wow. Valley civilization is that there, there is a particular seal that has survived, a, a seal that would have been used to stamp an imprint onto cloth or something like that. It's called the, the Pasupati seal. And it shows a figure which is, which is recognizable as the god Shiva, uh, who is, of course, a, a, an important deity in, in Indian culture to this day and, and in the Vedas. Um, and, and it shows that individuals seated in a, yeah, there you are. That's the Pasupati seal. Well, what you'll see is that, is that underneath, it, the way his feet are organized is that his heels are pointed forwards. Uh, this is a really difficult yoga position to sit like that and have your heels pointed forward. You've got to kind of almost disjoint your legs in order to do that, okay? And the problem, the problem with that is that it's an advanced yoga position. It's found, it's found in a seal that's 5,000 years old. We have to ask ourselves how many thousands of years before, before that, that was yoga Holy being developed? Holy shit. You know, uh, uh, again, there's a hint of a lost human culture in this. The, uh, the, the posture is called Mulabandasana. Um, and uh, I certainly can't do it. <laughs> <laughs> Unbelievable. Because what do we date modern Indian civilization back to? Is it well, 5,000 years ago? Since the Indus, 4, yeah, since the discovery of the Indus Valley civilization, you know, we have, we have to accept that civilization in, in India is, is, is at least 5,000 years old. The, 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 the largely and correctly discredited notion of an Aryan invasion of India needs to be abandoned as well. Yes, there were multiple cultures moving, moving back and forwards, but Indian culture is extremely, extremely ancient. 5,000 years old. Yeah, yeah. And, 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 and this valley, that's like a thing you'll learn about in textbooks. Yeah, right? yeah. yeah, you learn about it it's now. Like accepted, yeah. Uh, but, but, but what most people don't realize was nobody knew it even existed. It was a lost civilization. And the language is completely independent. There's no connectivity to anything nobody else. Can, nobody can connect it to anything. We, wow. don't know, we don't know what it was. There's some, there's some suggestion that it may have been Dravidian peoples, uh, the peoples who are now found in south, primarily in southern India, yeah. people, the Tamils. Uh, oh, okay. Yeah, uh, yeah. As a matter of fact, my wife is is, is Tamil. Gotcha. Um, yeah. and, and that's been very helpful to us when we've been researching in southern India. Uh, we did a lot of diving in southern. My wife is a photographer and, and a diver, as I, as I am, and we did a lot of diving in southern India. So it was it was great to be able to talk, for her to be able to talk in their own language to Tamil fishermen and Tamil divers, and see if they'd seen any weird stuff underwater, which they certainly had, and they took us to diving on, on structures wow. that uh, are a fully formed city off the, uh, off the town of Mahabalipuram. Now, you, you speak about this in the documentary, but I think this is really important to understand as well, that most of human civilization has been organized around water, right? Close yes. proximity to water, obviously you can fish, travel, etc. Mm -hmm. And as the water levels change, some of those ancient cities could be completely covered. Yes. You've recovered some of these. You've seen. This other is one people. of the things that I think is that I think is missing from our understanding of the past. Uh, it amused me, but also irritated me that that in that open letter to Netflix, the Society for American Archaeologists claimed that they could absolutely, for certain, be sure that there was no lost civilization during the Ice Age. They knew it was a fact. And if there had been any civilization, they would have found it right. and they would have published it. Right. Well, how do they know that there, how do they know that there was no lost civilization then? Because uh, it's really important to understand that archeology span um, is often driven by accidental finds. A lot of archeology, span particularly in the industrialized countries, 
is the result of somebody building, building uh, there's a huge building project going on. Maybe a housing state is going to be built. Yeah. Maybe a road is going to be built. Maybe a railway is going to be built. Uh, maybe a dam is going to be built. And then let's see, uh, let's call in the archaeologists to make sure that we're not going to wreck any ancient archaeology while we're doing this. And that's a lot of archaeological discoveries are made as a result of that, right. rather than of targeted inquiries. Um, the second issue with ruling out completely the possibility of a lost civilization is that archaeology sets itself up as the sole arbiter as to what is and what is not evidence. So I and my colleagues argue that we should consider the possibility of a much older Great Sphinx, as we've just been discussing, uh, on, the, on the basis of its geology. I'm just going to add a more complicated point. It's not only the geology. The Great Sphinx points perfectly due east. The sun rises perfectly due east on the spring equinox. If you go to the Giza Plateau or anywhere else in the world on the summer, northern hemisphere, on the summer solstice, you're going to see the sun rising far to the north of east. Go there on the winter solstice, you're going to see it far to the south of east. But on the spring equinox, it rises perfectly due east, directly in line with the gaze of the Sphinx. The Sphinx is looking at where the sun rises at dawn on the 21st of March in our calendar. Now, because of this wobble on the Earth's axis. What is that called again, the wobble? It's called precession. Precession, yeah. Uh, imagine a spinning top, which is, yeah, which is spinning and, and, is doing, and is kind of doing this. Yeah. And that's the viewing platform from which we observe the stars and the sun and the moon and everything else. And obviously the changes in its orientation are gonna change their orientation. And that's why, why we get the, the um, astrological ages. Again, mainstream science sneers at these things, but it is a simple astronomical fact that there are 12 constellations that lie along the path of the sun, which is called the ecliptic. And they are the constellations of the zodiac. Mm -hmm. uh, and right now we live in the age of Pisces, very near the end of the age of Pisces. Um, it's um, a simple fact that the ancient Christians uh, go back about 2,000 years. Ah, the fish. They, yeah. The fish was their thing. Uh, before that, it was Ares, the ram. Uh, ancient Egyptian symbolism at that time was very much focused on, on rams. Uh, go back before that, it's the age of Taurus, roughly the, py the pyramid age. That's, when, that's, that's why if you were building a, a huge 270 foot long rock hewn monument in the pyramid age, you'd be more likely to make it in the form of a bull than, than in the form, in form of, a, of, man. of a lion. Yeah. Of a lion. Oh, because lion. there is a time when you go back, guess when, about 12,000 years, that you find it's the constellation of Leo that is rising behind the sun. That's the, that's the age of Leo. Just as we live in the age of Pisces, that was the age of Leo. And there was a time when that monument would have looked directly at the place where the sun rises. First, it would have seen its own celestial counterpart, the constellation of Leo, sitting on the horizon, and then the sun rising beneath it. So to, to us, this, uh, and I, I speak of myself, Robert Boval, Robert Schock, John Anthony West, and a few others, we think it makes more sense, take the geology, take the astronomy, this monument has its origins 12,000 years ago. Hmm. But Egyptologists say, no, we know the Sphinx was built 4,500 years ago. Uh, the, I'm not gonna bore your audience with the details, but the evidence is incredibly flimsy. There isn't a single document that attributes the Great Sphinx to Khafre, who is supposed to be the builder of the Great Sphinx. There's nothing, it's just opinion, pure opinion. Uh, and, and we think that, that they are not right to dismiss the case for a much older Sphinx uh, and, and to say that. So they, have the, they select what evidence is evidence and what evidence isn't evidence. Uh, that's the, the second thing. And then the third and final thing is the huge areas of the world that have never been looked at by archaeology at all. Or if looked at by archaeology, looked at only minimally. Um, of course, the most important are the flooded continental shelves. And that's why Santa and I spent seven years of our lives, frequently risking our lives, uh, scuba diving all around the world. Uh, the sea level rose 400 feet at the end of the last ice age. Let's be clear, it did not rise 400 feet overnight. Right. This was a rise that was extended over a period of 11 or 12,000 years, from about 21,000 years ago down to 10,000. It was even still rising about 6,000 years ago. All over the world? All over feet? the world, yeah. It was a global, the, all the world's oceans are connected and all, all see, but, but in local areas, if you have a very steep coastline, the effect of the sea level rise, the amount of land it eats up is gonna be a lot less than if you have a gradually sloping coastline. Mm. And, and 120 feet level sea level rise on a very steep bit of coast is gonna remove Completely relatively different. less land. Whereas on a very sloping bit of coast, uh, it's going to, it's going to uh, inundate much more land. Mm -hmm. uh, and the calculation is that 27 million square kilometers that was above water during the ice age is underwater now. Mm. Roughly, I think that's roughly 10 million square miles. I can't do the math in my head, but mm -hmm. 
something like that. So it's an awful lot of land. I, I think it's Europe and China added together. Wow. Uh, there, it's, it's not that there's been no archaeology well, done on the continental shelves. I think we're looking at something from Alexandria here. Yes. Yeah, we are. We are. I've dived there as well. Um, and and that's, wow. um, that's inundated not because of sea level rise, but because of subsidence of the Nile silts. Uh, off the, the Alexandria stands on the Nile Delta, and the the silt subsided and resulted in what the flooding the of this. Uh, the Nile carries a lot of silt with it, a lot of earth with it, as it flows out of Uganda and out of Ethiopia, and northwards into Egypt. And you come to the Nile Delta, and all that earth it's carrying, which also provided the fertility of ancient Egypt, all that silt is then dumped in the Nile Delta, and there were constructions were made on top of it. And those, that, the, the, the submergence of the sites off Alexandria, uh, which is a magical, spooky place to dive, by the way. I've been lucky enough to dive there. The submergence of those sites is largely because of subsidence of land rather than sea level rise, because it's relatively recent. Those, those, so those, those if sites you're saying the old. silt itself has dropped. Yeah, yeah. Right, so anything it was on solid top, ground. Yeah, uh, anything built you. on top of it went down. 